Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace in his name. Amen. As we talked about last week, we began last week with the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And today we have something that's from the very center of that sermon. The Sermon on the Mount is a summary of all of Jesus' teachings, the way that Matthew lays them out. And again, last week we talked about the blesseds as this very introductory piece. And the way that Matthew tends to write his, his, his story, he tends to place things at the apex of his story. So this being the very center part of the Sermon on the Mount is a very important part of Jesus' sermon, the way that Matthew writes. We find ourselves kind of everything else hinging on this little point of the sermon where he teaches us to pray with some very familiar words. But before we get to those words, all right, I want to, uh, well, I'd like, to, I'd like something else to take a look at a little bit before we get there. And it starts out with how this section of our gospel today starts out. It starts out with a little bit of a warning, a little bit of a fair uh, call just to pay attention to things. Jesus is saying to us, do not practice your piety, that is, doing of your religion in such a way that it is there to impress others. Along the same lines, he also warns against hypocritical and, and empty words. Loud and long prayers in the midst of a congregation, kind of like, you know, dear Lord, I thank you that I'm not like these other sinners that are around us, and they use long phrases and flowery language to, 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 to pray on their own behalfs. Now, if you're sitting there and you're thinking about this, you're thinking, well, why is Jesus very concerned about this? Because I'm a lifelong Lutheran, and I've never heard a long or flowery prayer in my life, uh, much less uttered one. This doesn't seem to be a problem most Lutherans have. We are not overly ostentatious in our prayer lives. In fact, we have gone so far from ostentatious prayer lives that we've often forgotten to pray altogether. So this is a response that Jesus comes back to us on this very common phrase. If I had a dime for every time somebody said, Pastor, I just don't know how to pray. Is there, a, how do you pray? How do we do this thing called praying? Well, I'd have a bunch of dimes, probably not enough to buy anything really important, but I'd have a bunch of dimes. But prayer is one of the things that is a centerpiece of the life of faith. It is something I do get asked about fairly often. And Jesus, when he's speaking today in our gospel lesson, is assuming that it is something that you will do as part of your faith life. Prayer is part of what it means to be a faithful person. Now, you guys did pretty well last week, and we're going to try to break some of your Lutheran bad habits on this interactive bit, all right? So we're going to do this, and I'm going to be moving again, and I'm going to be working towards you, so don't let this frighten you. But I want you to answer a couple of questions for me. I'll let, we'll start with just a hand-raising bit. You guys can do this. So how many of you, when you were younger said prayers before bedtime with your siblings or your mom and dad. You can raise your hands. All right. How many of you have ever said a prayer before a meal? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you still, until this day, tend to say your prayers either in the morning or in the evening before you go to bed? All right. Good for you. All right. It is part of life. Prayers during these times are part of what it means to live a faithful life. And it's not necessarily rocket science, all right? Anne Lamott has said, there are three prayers that are necessary in life. Help, thanks, and wow. Matter of fact, she wrote a whole book about it. And, and it's some good advice, and she's not the first to come up with that. She's in good company. Um, Meister Eckhart, who was a German mystic who lived about 750 years ago, said, if your only prayer that you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. So prayer is assumed to be a part of life. He assumes, Jesus does, that we will pray as our life together. So his disciples, as was common practice during his day, came up to him and said, Rabbi, teach us how we ought to pray. So Jesus teaches his disciples with a very old custom, and he starts his prayer this way. He says, when you pray, pray this way. And here comes the interactive part. He says, when you pray, pray this way, our Father. A very simple phrase. Those two words set the tone for this whole prayer. The first word, our. 
This is a prayer that is not an individual's prayer. Even if you only say it by yourself in the mornings or at nighttime before you go to bed as you repeat the Lord's Prayer, you are always praying this prayer with the gathered people of God in Jesus Christ. This is not my Father. This is not a Father. This is our Father. It is a corporate sense of the word. And then there's that word Father. In the Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke at the time, the word that he used was Abba, like the 70s band with the Swedes, okay? But not like the 70s band with the Swedes. This was a very affectionate term for daddy. It's a very relational term. So right away with the first two words of this prayer, our, which is a plural, and father, which is a relational term, we are set in this very deeply relational essence of prayer. It's not just about me. It is about us, and it's not just about us, it's about us and God, all of us. Then there's a term that comes next. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed. What does hallowed mean? Do we know what hallowed means? We have some mumblings out here. Holy. All right, what does holy mean? You can't use a deferred word to define a word that we don't know what it means. Holy means to be set apart, to be set special, to be reserved, holy and hallowed. So how do we do that? Hallowed would be your name. God's name is to be hallowed. I am not one that just fell off the turnip truck. I've been in this world. I know that God's name is not frequently hallowed in the way that God would approve of. So how do we hallow God's name in our day-to-day lives. How do we set God's name as holy, as hallowed, as set apart, as something special? Well, one way that we do that is we remember to pray. Another way that we do that is when we reach out in love, when we study God's word, those are ways that we hallow God's name. Then we get to this next section. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom. Okay, come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how is this? So where is God's kingdom? A lot of times we will say that God's kingdom is is in heaven. People that rightfully say that, that is true. But God's kingdom also happens amongst us daily as we pray this prayer, as we talk to others about God's graciousness, as we live into our callings as Christian sisters and brothers. We are bringing God's kingdom into this world. God's kingdom will is being done when the hungry are fed, when the lonely are talked to, when the sad are consoled. These are signs of God's inbreaking kingdom. Then we get to this next phrase. Give us this day our daily bread. Now understand this again. This is not give me my daily bread. This again is a plural. Give us this day our daily bread. What are things that are daily bread? Okay, we'll start out with a really easy one. Shelby's got this one. Bread. All right. Now the rest of the congregation that is, you know, past junior high, uh, do we have any other things that are daily bread? Oh, you can, you can, big voices. I'm going deaf. I'm getting older. So, What's that? Clothing. Shelter. Shelter. Clothing. Everything we need. Everything we eat. Everything we need. Friends. Are they daily bread? Parents. If you are younger. Are they daily bread? Absolutely. When I was on the island, um, up on Washington Island, in order to get stuff up to the island, there is a ferry. And in, we were teaching this in confirmation class. And I said to the confirmation kids, I said, is the ferry daily bread? And they looked at me and said, well, you can't eat it. And I said, no, you can't eat it. That would be a little difficult. But I said, think about this. If it wasn't for the ferry, where would your food come from? If it wasn't for the ferry, where would the gas and the oil that heats your house come from? Is the ferry daily bread? And in fact, it was daily bread for the residents of that island. So when you see the truck driving down the road, when you see the quick trip vehicle filling up the gas station, those are things that are daily bread as well. Daily bread covers a vast amount of things. Then we move into this very interesting part of the prayer. Forgive us our sins or 
debts or trespasses. Those are all words that are translated in this phrase in our reading today. It was translated debts, and it's translated debts for a very real reason, because it is something that we owe God. Our sins, our behaviors, our things that cause a debt that we can never repay. And we are asking in this prayer that God take these things away from us. All right? Now, it's very specific. We've been talking very generally along here. But God, in Jesus Christ, in teaching us this prayer, talks about forgiveness very specifically. And I think he does it for this reason. We're like this little girl who was fighting with her friend and her mother who heard about the quarrel, talked to her daughter and trying to show her that she was wrong to be holding this grudge and it was to show God's forgiveness to her friend. Accordingly, when the little one kneeled down to pray, she humbly asked God, please forgive me for getting so angry and quarreling with Charlotte. So far, things were going well. But the child's disposition was still there, for the child continued on in her prayer, and make Charlotte come to me and ask me for my forgiveness, O Lord, and give her no rest until she's sorry and comes to me and tells me so. <laughs> Jesus says, we are to forgive others as God forgives us. Matter of fact, if we don't forgive others, it will be impossible for God in some ways to forgive us because it will keep that forgiveness from flowing through us to others. When we dam up those things, when we for fail to forgive others, we are failing to let forgiveness work within us as well. And then finally we get this, this another us. Do not bring us to the time of trial. That's a really, really wonderful plea. We, we ask here to be delivered from this time of trial, of temptation and difficulties. And finally, it brings us to this last one where we're all asking this together and deliver us from the evil one. That's the way our lesson phrases it today. Deliver us from the evil one. And I find it fascinating that all through this prayer, as Jesus teaches us this prayer, it is us and we and this corporateness except for when it comes to dealing with the actual cause of evil, and that is brought down to the one, to the singular. When it's all about you, when it's all about me, then we are susceptible to the forces of evil in this world. But when we pray together this prayer and remember that we are in this together with Christ and with our brothers and sisters in his name, we receive forgiveness and mercy and grace. So back to the broader arc of this story, why we were brought into this thing. There's lots of stuff in this prayer. There's lots of stuff in our gospel lesson today. So where do we find the good news? Where do we find the gospel? Jesus says at the very beginning of our lesson today, he says, your father knows what you need before you even pray. So the question may be, why do we pray? Now Jesus, as I mentioned, was assuming that we would pray. So why do we pray at all if Jesus tells us that God already knows what we need before we pray? Why do we pray? It's sort of like it was, I think, when I was raising my kids, all right? They got to the point where there'd be um, their bottle or something, a cookie on the counter or something, and they'd be sitting in their high chair, and they'd be gesturing towards something, and they would grunt at it. Uh, uh, and we, mom and I would say, use your words. Because in using your words, I would, as her father, or as Daniel's father, or Hannah's father, I would understand what they're talking about. But as they grow in relationship with others, grunting was not going to do. They needed to be able to communicate to one another, with each other. This is a very relational aspect. God wants us to communicate back and forth with him so that we may con communicate back and forth with each other as fellow Christians. How will we know where our needs are? How will we know what we need? And, and how will we communicate our faith together unless we are practiced in using these words? So God says, learn how to pray. Talk to me, for I know what your needs are. It's a deeply relational skill, is prayer. It's about communication. It is about God working within our lives. It's about reminding us of those things that we need the most. And Jesus finally says, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. 
If we treasure our conversation with God, if we learn to trust in God in all things, from daily bread to moment to moment breath, our treasure will be in heaven where it belongs, which frees us in the here and now to forgive as we have been forgiven, to serve as we have been served, and to love as we have first been loved. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.